When it comes to the God Hand, most Berserk fans agree on two things. Number one, they're heinous SOBs who would never get the pass from any sane-brained human. And number two, except Slan because of course she does. The only female God Hand member looks and acts like the goth succubus of your dreams. She's beautiful, has wings, and an intense and disturbing fascination with the macabre, even for a demon. But a lot of her current appearance and philosophy of life has to do with her anatomy, because at one point in her life, Slan was a regular human like us. She only became femme fatale extraordinaire after going through anatomical changes that would, once again, get a pass from any sane-brained human. As a god hand, Slan is one of the strongest beings in existence, and her influence is directly felt in the story on multiple occasions. But what sets her apart from the rest of her compeers is that she actually gives us some information on her inhuman anatomy herself, which has helped crackpots like us enhance our true understanding of a series we thought we had all figured out. So, without further ado, this is Slan's Anatomy Explore. The only guardian angel of desire that actually looks desirable. Slan's Introduction to Berserk. The chapters that properly introduce the concept of apostles and the god hand to the world are all titled Guardian Angels of Desire, yet only one out of these five angels even remotely represents something desirable. Well, desire is a subjective term because its literal definition is the strong feeling of wanting something or wishing for something to happen. But when you and I think of desire in a regular context, our minds are more likely to go towards sexual desire than not, and Slan is the pure embodiment of desire in that context. She dates debuts at the very end of Guardian Angels of Desire Part 4, alongside the rest of her kinsmen. And while the rest of her kinsmen are distinct thanks to their particularly demonic appearances, Slan is distinct because of how singularly undemonic she looks. If you take away the wings, of course. Ubik has tentacles for a lower body, Conrad has plague spots on his face and louse appendages on his back, Femto looks like demonic Hawkman, and Void is actually an evil version of Megamind if you stop and think about it. But Slan? Well, she's the definition of of a seductive semi-succubi. In her released form as a god hand member, Slan's appearance is that of an exceedingly beautiful woman whose demonic apparel does nothing to cover the things they're actually supposed to be covering. She's mostly bare save for the half corset that covers the region between her bosom and her cervix, and this corset is also the origin point of her leathern, bat-like wings, which are massive in size. She also has a fetishist neck brace around her throat, which complements her tendril-like hair. The reason why Slan has hair that looks like tendrils probably has something to do with the inspiration for her naming. Slan was named after a science fiction novel of the same name, written by A. E. Van Vaught back in 1940. The story features a race of super beings called Slans, whose genetic superiority makes them faster, stronger, and smarter than humans. But the real kicker is the fact that some Slans are born with golden tendrils extending from their heads, which give them psychic abilities. There are two types of Slans in the story, the ones who have the tendrils and those who don't. Tendril Slans can read minds and basically go Professor X on anyone's ass, but the non-tendril slans can't. Conversely, they're the only ones who can shield themselves from their species' counterparts' psychic powers. All of this makes for an interesting narrative that was retroactively presented with the Hugo Award, one of the most prestigious sci-fi and fantasy writing awards. But what's relevant to this video is the fact that Miura took these psychic tendrils and gave them to his leading femme fatale. And make no mistake, Slan is exactly what we just called her, a peak example of a femme fatale. At the very beginning of the Berserk manga, we see Guts knee-deep in some Apostle Guts. Now, this Apostle can be thought of as a succubus from a technical standpoint because she seduced Guts with her human beauty before she tried to kill him and send him to hell as a person marked by the brand of sacrifice. But her true form was anything but seductive, instead being a cross between Alien and Predator, some of the major inspirations behind Miura's masterpiece. Slan, on the other hand, looks and behaves like a textbook succubus, and her true appearance reflects the ideal version of a femme fatale. She has fang teeth, but you'll forget that when you see her run her tongue over them. She has eyes that are lit up with demonic evil energy, but you'll forget that in her presence if you don't possess the iron will of guts. Slan's physical appearance makes her look like the least threatening of the five god hand members, but that's probably just to camouflage the fact that she's one of the most demented members of the god hand. 
When Guts tries to attack Griffith, despite suffering from multiple near-fatal injuries and nearly manages to get it done, Slan is delighted at the boy's resilience. She praises his will and endurance because, as Femto explained a moment earlier, someone bearing the brand of sacrifice would feel such immense pain in the presence of a God Hand member that the pain itself could end up killing them. It looked like that's what happened to Slan when Guts approached Femto for the first time, but the Black Swordsman recovered his consciousness out of pure rage and managed to get a swing in despite all the pain and broken bones. This only excited Slan to the point that she wished Guts would join the side of the demons. And on the surface, this appears smart, right? Slan wants to recruit a guy who's so badass that he can withstand the life-threatening pain that the presence of a god hand can induce. She should be in the military or some shit because of her keen eye for soldiers, right? Well, the truth is, she's actually the biggest sadomasochist in both the physical and astral worlds. And the only reason she wanted Guts was because of his capacity to withstand unimaginable pain. Slan liked the fact that despite having broken fingers, chipped off nails, and fractured bones, Guts was able to stand up and fight. And this has a lot to do with her unique anatomy as a God Hand member, believe it or not. She was a regular human woman until she found a crimson egg how Slan became a God Hand member, and what it meant for her anatomy. In her second ever appearance in the manga, Slan rises from the ground of Griffith's Eclipse interstice like a megalith, but her form is different from the one we just described. She looks almost entirely human, no half corset or an NSFW neck brace. And while she retains her wings, they appear more angelic than demonic. What we mean by that is Slan's manifestation in Chapter 75 of Berserk shows her having black feathered wings initially before she assumes her proper form as the vampiric goth seductress we know and love. This might seem insignificant to you, but there's a reason for this because we actually do see Slan take this form in another part of the manga, yet under a totally different context. For now, let's talk about her existence as a god hand and why it makes her appreciate pain on an anatomical level. Like every other member of the god hand, Slan used to to be a human being. She's at least 216 years old, given that the eclipse cycle occurs only once every 216 years, and that's her exact age as a God Hand member if she ascended just before Griffith, which she most likely did. Now, as a human, Slan had all the anatomical strengths and weaknesses of a human woman, and if we were to take a stab at her fatal flaw, which ended up defining her current existence as a God Hand member, it would be that Slan most likely had desires that were forbidden for her station of service. In Berserk, any demonic entity's previous life as a human being ends up reflecting their current appearance because their current existence is essentially an idealized version of themselves, free of their human inhibitions. It would make sense that Slan was kind of like pre-redemption Farnese, and that she was likely a woman associated with a religious station whose desires went contrary to her fate. Slan is often the God Hand member that explains the true cost and meaning of a sacrifice to demon kind, and that may well be because she sacrificed someone who was very close to her possibly her lover. Well, lovers or family members or convent sisterhood given that the sacrifices needed to become a God Hand member is sacrifices plural, but this is unusual in that the two God Hand sacrifices we know of, those of Femto and Void, had targets that were entirely unrelated to the kind of intimate soul bond that Slan often tells people they need to give up in order to ascend. For instance, Griffith sacrificed the Band of the Falcon, but he said that they didn't matter to him right up until the bitter end. Void is suspected to have sacrificed King Geyser capital city, and it's hard to claim that every one of those people held an equal place in his heart as a human when Geysirk City is the modern-day kingdom of Midland. And yes, you did hear that correctly, the city was the size of a kingdom. So what makes the God Hand sacrifices different from an apostle's sacrifice? Well, two things in our opinion. The first, obviously, is the Crimson Behelet. Most apostles ascend using regular Behelets, but the Crimson Behelet only appears once in over two centuries because it was created with the explicit purpose of transforming humans into God Hand members, and not just the rank and file of demon kind. If you want to know more about this mysterious artifact and how it works, go check out our Crimson Behelet Origins video in our Berserk playlist. There's tons of cool stuff in there. The second is the fact that at the moment of their ascension, a human being who has been marked for transcendence feels despair and desires so intense that it far outweighs anything any other person can feel, and this despair and desire is driven solely by their immense ego. See, there are countless apostles in Berserk at this point, more than we care to enumerate but their purpose for ascendance is all the same. An 
over-attachment to life and an intense fear of death. This is true for the God Hand as well, only their situation is amplified a thousandfold, making their transformations practically calamities unto themselves. Slan was also probably tortured to the brink of death at some point in her human life, as that seems to be a theme with the God Hand members, given Void was allegedly tortured according to chapter 138, and Griffith was definitely tortured according to everything that happens following chapter 39. Regardless, once Slan hit a point where her despair and desire were so intense that her sanity snapped, she wanted nothing but the power to escape her reality, and it activated the Crimson Behalit in her possession, which caused a fissure to open up in her internal anatomy. See, what happens when you trigger a Behalit is that it opens a portal to the astral world by summoning a dimensional plane called the Interstice, and it uses the heart of the person who activated it as the conduit for its activation duration. Once turned on, the Behalit summons the God Hand, who then offer the Behalit's owner the promise of eternal life and power in exchange for sacrifice. At the time Slan met the God Hand, it must have had three members at best, but that wouldn't change the routine. Void must have greeted her to that same infernal feast. Ubik would have manipulated her with the same psychic tricks, and Conrad's altar raising could have been creepier than it was during Griffith's time. Once Slan was convinced to give up her humanity entirely, she sacrificed her lovers and or loved ones as the God Hand closed around her mortal shell. Her astral body descended into the depths of the astral world, felt the sacrifices she had just made piercing through it, and then finally reached the abyss, where it came face to face with the idea of evil. After understanding the way things really work in the Berserkverse, Slan, like Griffith, must have asked for wings, because she then ascends as the vampiric goth succubus we spent a good three minutes describing in our previous segment, with none of her previous humanity intact. Instead, she was now a sadomasochist of the highest degree, who viewed the confluence of opposing ideals as the most beautiful things in the world, conflating pain with pleasure like a true Cenobite. In this aspect, Slan is the closest anatomic relative of the general inspiration behind the God Hand, but let's keep things focused on Berserk here. Once Slan committed herself to the idea of evil, her entire existence changed on an anatomical level, because she went from being a mortal in the physical world to one of the strongest astral beings overnight. She gained awareness of the flow of causality, or fate, as it was called in the earliest Berserk chapters, like every other member of the God Hand, but her grasp over it wasn't absolute. While the God Hand can generally predict how an event will play out, they apparently can't foresee things down to the last detail, evidenced by Slan's absolute shock at Guts and Casca's survival given how utterly unexpected it was. This might vary depending on the role the idea of evil has planned for you in the grand scheme of things, because high-tier apostles like Zod seem to be able to interpret causality to an extent, and it has been hinted that Void can see things his compeers cannot multiple times in the series. But that isn't the only difference between these two adherents of demon kind. When a person becomes an apostle, they usually end up affecting things in the physical world because their link to the abyss is only partial. This is why we can see many apostles exhibit human-like emotions and values, like the Slug Count, Irvine, Locus, Grunbeld, and even Zod. Heck, Slan's introduction itself was proof that while apostles were certainly powered by the essence of evil, they still somewhat retained a connection to their human lives. For the God Hand, this connection is completely severed because as the God Hand members descend into the abyss, their hearts are frozen by the idea of evil, and they become immune to all of their previously human emotions. All they are driven by now is their primal desires, and perhaps as a consequence of that, the God Hand cannot take shape in the physical world. In chapter 142, Skullnut explains that the God Hand, like all astral beings, exist within the collective subconscious of humanity as a massive body of thought. They don't have a physical form unless they're summoned by using behelots or something, but that doesn't mean their influence is not felt by regular mortals. Being a huge body of thought, the God Hand uses humanity's collective subconscious and manipulates physical events as well to create temporal junction points that end up strengthening the Hand of Evil. Remember how we told you that Slan's pseudo-angelic form was something you should keep in mind? Well that's because after becoming a God Hand, that's the form Slan uses to manipulate humanity into worshipping her as some sort of goddess of degeneracy. During the Conviction arc, we learn that the cult that has been operating outside of St. Albion isn't just some kind of random sect of heretics. The activities of these people 
people are closely related to the incarnation ceremony that the conviction arc focuses on, and that's a result of the direct influence of the God Hand on the physical world. In that same chapter that we mentioned just a few moments ago, Skull Knight explains to Guts that as a massive body of thought, the God Hand could not affect the physical world itself. But whenever a huge confluence of people gathered in one location bearing negative thoughts and emotions, it would open those people up to the influence of the God Hand via indirect means. During the Revelations chapter, we learn that Midland is currently facing a plague, and then we see the God Hand Conrad manifest partially into the physical world using rats as a medium. Then, during the Conviction arc, we see that the Cult of the Flame Goddess, which is what Slan is referred to by the humans in her pseudo-angelic form, is committing horrifying acts in her name, but they're not that far off the mark when it comes to predicting the future. The Cult of the Flame Goddess are a bunch of drug-addled, cannibalistic hedonists who all gathered around a cook fire and have massive orgies to true awareness or whatever. But their high priest does make a few statements that are pretty bang on the money. In chapter 136, as he roams about the camps of St. Albion with a dead crow on a cross, the priest claims that the flame goddess has given him a revelation. That revelation? Tis the hawk. He screams that the hawk shall alight and drive away the barbarians, and it shall lead us to be one nation, which is a scarily accurate description of what happens during the rest of the series. After the incarnation ceremony, Femto comes into the physical world in a body of flesh, thanks to the egg of the perfect world, and he goes on to defeat the barbaric Kushan Empire before establishing Falconia, the sole haven for mankind in the global interstice of Fantasia. This tells us that while the God Hand was not able to physically affect the world, it was able to certainly infect the minds of humanity, being a body of thought and all, and cause physical events to occur through that medium. Slan seems to be mostly associated with degeneracy instead of simple lust and berserk, because she inspires all kinds of debauched acts, from drug abuse to cannibalism, and all of it in the name of finding that sweet spot between pleasure and pain. But in amongst all that, she also manages to play her part in Femto's incarnation to perfection, because her cannibal sex cult is what triggers the events of the incarnation ceremony. In fact, we wouldn't be surprised if it was Slan's influence that turned the slug count into an apostle the first time around. After all, he did sacrifice his wife, whom he'd just caught having a pagan orgy in his castle. The scope of her influence on humans is massive, and all of it is thanks to her anatomical existence as a body of thought. But that isn't even where things end, because Slan can manage to do crazier things than inspiring hordes of people into becoming heinous heretics. The personification of blurring the lines between life and death, pleasure and pain. Slan's true powers as a god hand. The reason why we keep calling Slan a sadist and an entity far more disturbing than any of her brethren is because of the fact that she finds beauty in the most horrific of circumstances. During Griffith's eclipse, Slan was elated at Guts' defense of her soon-to-be kinsman, because it only made him an even better sacrifice in her opinion. Later on, when Griffith, in his new existence as Femto, violates Casca in front of Guts as the corpses of his former comrades lay strewn about the interstitial space, Slan sheds a tear, not in protest of the violation she was witnessing, but in support of it. As we said earlier, to Slan, the confluence of opposing concepts is the greatest thing in the world. Life and death, love and hate, friendship and enmity, all of it was at loggerheads with each other during Griffith's eclipse, and she was one happy voyeur that day. But what kept her gaze wasn't her fellow compere, or even the woman who got assaulted. It was the man who lost an arm and an eye, but somehow kept fighting, despite going through unimaginable pain. In her first appearance, Slan told the rest of the God Hand that she wanted Guts to become their even though Conrad pointed out that the boy wasn't ordained by the laws of fate. Still, she kept tabs on Guts after meeting him during Griffith's eclipse, and is the only God Hand member other than Griffith to have directly approached him outside of it as well. After the success of the Incarnation Ceremony, a sort of countdown timer began. The Incarnation Ceremony was the first sign of the eventual merging of the physical and astral worlds via the Great Roar, and in its immediate aftermath, malevolent astral beings like trolls and ogres started manifesting manifesting in the physical world, which was a highly unusual occurrence. Enoch Village became the backdrop for our introduction to the astral world, and magic proper and berserk. But turns out that all the troll attacks, the kidnapping of Casca and Fardise, and the wild goose chase that Guts's party went on because of it, was all because Slan wanted to see Guts. Recall that we called the God Hand a massive body of thought in our previous segment. Well, what happens when thoughts start blending with reality? They cause changes to the physical world, and that's exactly exactly what happens from chapter 214 through chapter 221, as they take place in the astral world's region of darkness called Klippoth. There, you'll find an assortment of dark-natured astral 
beings that can give you nightmares or turn your life into one if you aren't wary. But what it really is, is something entirely different and more disturbing than any of that. As Guts reaches the inner sanctum of the trolls that kidnapped Casca and Farnese, he ends up trapping himself there after letting loose for the first time in a long time. Guts thought his biggest worry would be getting out of that place alive, and he was instantly proven wrong when Slan manifested herself using a bunch of troll guts as a medium. She immediately overpowers Guts with her tendril-like hair, grabbing hold of him, removing his armor, and viciously slashing his body with an attack that hurts his body and soul. Then she tries to taunt him into joining their ranks by using the behelet he has been carrying around since the Black Swords Monarch but Skull Knight interrupts and immediately tries to pick a fight with her. He calls her something we don't care to repeat on our channel, but suffice it to say he isn't exactly inaccurate, because Slan proves his point by turning Kliphoff's domain into her own personal wound. Using nothing more than her evil essence, she's able to spawn countless trolls and ogres, and replace the fallen ones with newborns at breakneck speeds, keeping up with one of the fastest fighters in the world in Skull Knight. This is one of her greatest anatomical strengths in our opinion. As a metaphysical entity, Slan shows the astral world's region of darkness, Kliphoff, as her preferred Sephira of existence. As a consequence, she had complete control over its population, and she could spawn astral creatures endlessly if left uninterrupted in that same region. But this is also where we see the true extent of Slan's depravity, because when Guts blasts her in her guts with his arm cannon, it only arouses her. And when he runs her through with his malice-tempered dragon slayer, Slan ends up kissing him as a reward for giving her such fun. She is able to survive survive a full body dissection by the Dragon Slayer, but what she also ends up doing is creating Guts' tomb for him. Slan's forced advent into the physical world via the overlapping domain of Kliphoff was bad enough, but Guts splitting her womb in the middle of her spam spawning trolls and ogres ended up causing life and death to commingle within it, which caused a dimension to collapse. Slan simply vanished back into the astral world following her tryst with Guts, but Guts only survived thanks to Skull Knight's space-tearing sword of actuation. If that sword had not been present in that moment with him, he'd have become Astral Toast, so to speak. Slan is the only God Hand member who has been shown to be capable of such an act so far, and it makes sense given that she's the only female God Hand member as well. Following this act, she isn't seen in the series up until the great roar of the Astral World, following which she manifests as a sea of flesh that, as of now, remains unfound in the new world of Fantasia. We don't know how this is possible given that she's now a literal sea of flesh, but we will see what happens to her as the series continues to unfold. Marvelous Verdict However, when it comes to this video, we're afraid that's all we've got for you. Slan is one of the most popular God Hand members, and on the surface you can see why that's the case. But when you strip back those layers of superficial filth and degeneracy, a much darker truth emerges, and the fact that it is all down to her anatomical existence as a massive body of negative thought is all thanks to the idea of evil. Slan is the ultimate definition of forbidden desire for us, because we would love to be with her, but we'd hate to be with her. And that's not something she can change because it's hardwired into her existence as a god hand thanks to the idea. But what do you guys think of Slan's anatomy? Let us know in the comment section down below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and we'll see you guys in the next one. Until then, keep struggling, strugglers.